the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Magic Monastery by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Catharsis Jan Fishan Khan heard that a certain narrow-minded scholar was bitterly attacking the culture, nature and ideas of one of his neighbours. He invited both of them to a feast. And beforehand he said to the neighbour, Whatever I say tonight, make sure that you do not react to it in any way. After the meal, as is customary, the host started to orate. He turned to the company and began to berate the very man whom the scholar was opposing. Without interruption for nearly an hour, he spoke of the man's supposed iniquities and enlarged, with quite unusual loquacity and totally devastating vituperation, upon the villainy and frightfulness of the victim. Throughout this harangue, nobody, including the neighbour, moved a muscle. At the end of the outburst, the scholar stood up and cried, In the name of God, let us have no more of this! I saw my own behaviour in you just now, and I cannot bear the sight. This man's patience has destroyed me. Jan Fishan Khan said, In being here tonight we all took a chance. You, that our friend here might attack you. I, that you might have been further inflamed by my vituperation instead of being shamed by it. And he, that he might start to believe that I was really against him. Now we have solved the problem. The risk remains that the account of this interchange, passed from mouth to ear by those who do not know what we were doing, will represent our friend as weak, you as easily influenced, and me as easily angered. Fantasy The professor said, Gentlemen, among the most rewarding sides of psychoanthropology is the analysis of myths and legends of primitive peoples. Such a study casts brilliant light upon the incapacities of undeveloped man, as well as upon his compensation mechanism, how he invents marvels, magical substitutes for the fulfilments which he has never experienced. As an example, consider the ancient legend, met in many different communities, of the camera. This instrument was supposed to be able to capture in frozen form events which were visible to the spectator and to reproduce them, or a similitude of them, at will. I need hardly say that the entire conception of such an apparatus springs only from the very human desire to preserve moments of excitement and pleasure. Then there is the fable about the production of an energy of a special kind, in some languages called electricity. This has truly wonderful wish-fulfillment properties. Why, by connecting to a supply of electricity different kinds of apparatus, a man was reputed to have been able to cause heat or cold, to kill or to stimulate, to transmit the human voice for incalculable distances. There are, I regret to say, even today sadly misled people who imagine that these legends contain what they like to call a germ of truth. Some of them have even gone so far as to postulate reasons why they are likely to be true. But the explanations are always too bizarre. The wishful thinkers have to invent a myth or at least graft one myth onto another. An instance is the answer of the cranks to the question, why are there no cameras or electrical contrivances now? The answer is, of all amazing rationalizations, because at a certain time all the metal in the world was atomized, so we can't make them now. You observe that in order to sustain the fantasy, it has been necessary to invent a wondrous substance, known in the legends of some tribes as metal. 
kindness. A teacher gave a letter to his disciple to be opened after his death and to be shown to his successor. The letter said, I have been unkind to this disciple. When he heard the contents, the disciple was overcome with grief and said, He was so generous that he saw his great kindness to me as cruelty, compared to the greatest kindness which might have been possible. A year or so later, the successor called the disciple to him again and asked him to make a further comment on the letter. I now understand, said the disciple, that the word unkind was quite correct. Ordinary human beings show friendliness when they have nothing of greater value to impart. What need of kindness or cruelty from a bestower of treasures? If the sultan's slave is handing over gold, what matters it if he smiles or frowns the while? The well-intentioned man may give away sweetmeats, the physician bestows curative medicine, whether people think the medicine is bitter or sweet. Misjudged There was once a sage who had a considerable number of followers, and also many enemies. The enemies resolved to kill him, and discovered that he allowed people to enter his house and wander all through it. They poisoned a number of apples, and left them in various rooms. This happened several times, and after some months the poisoners were amazed to discover that the sage was still alive and well. Some of them concluded that he was a saint of such subtle and complete perceptions that he had been able to avoid the apples, or even to eat poison without ill effect. They went to him, and throwing themselves on the ground, said, we realize that you must indeed be a saint and wish to become your disciples. Your grounds for supposing that I am a saint do not impress me, said the sage. And if you are really interested, I have to tell you that I escaped your plot because I do not happen to eat fruit that I find lying about the house. Scratching there was once a man who scratched himself. His scratching became so extensive that people asked him why he did it. All he could say was, I don't know. Physicians were called in, and none could find the source of the scratching. After many years, a wise man visited the town of the scratcher. The people brought the sufferer to the main square to show him to the sage. There was a long pause. Then the wise man spoke. This individual, he said, is scratching. You have asked me to tell you the reason. I have applied my intellect to the problem and I can give you the answer. The man scratches because he is itching. The Oatland Story There was once a man who adopted oatmeal as the be-all and end-all of life. His reason for making this decision is not questioned by his numerous followers, because they came to hold this wisdom to be self-evident. Critics, who are sure to be biased, of course, have disputed whether it was because his name happened to be Arvena, Latin for oat, or whether he merely became obsessed by some form of self-flattery based on his sense of the fitness of things. He certainly liked oats, if we are to believe the ancient chronicles. To him they were beautiful, tasty, nutritious, and versatile. He rapidly convinced many people of these and other advantages. He was, of course, marked by his idealism, logicality, dedication to the cause, and exemplary life. Even porridge, as he was easily able to demonstrate, gave scope for practical as well as theoretical applications, extension, inventions, and even lyricism. He and his early associates cultivated oats, sniffed them powdered, applied them in various ways to the skin. Oats were soon found useful for such diverse things as glue, bricks, modelling, making paper, feeding rats, and purposes of religious observance. Baked, sawed, and coloured, treated in a thousand different ways, 
generations of tireless and heroic experimenters found the substance a means for the liberation of man and the enrichment of his life. The diversity of Otish applications itself stimulated people to ever greater achievements. Who could doubt the value, and then inevitably the indispensability, of such a discovery? All civilization could be seen as built upon oats. The analogies, symbolism, and other more refined relationships of oats, too, played a full part in human culture. Even before many of these developments had taken place, the birth of Oatland was a foregone conclusion. Because of this unique flowering of the Oatish genius, it was at first called the Land of Oats. When, quite logically, the word oat itself came to denote perfection, the country accepted the title of the Oat of Lands. Oatism became a valued and self-perpetuating system because its results were proved by its assumptions and its assumptions were proved by its results. A certain form of education was characteristic of Oatland. Naturally, it was the only form. Who would have built schools if it had not been necessary to pass on Oatishness? How could the civilization have developed without oats and without institutions which taught otistically, so that the younger generation could benefit from the heritage of otism for which so many had suffered and to build up which so many had labored for so long? If schools had not been devised, man would certainly have remained sunk in ignorance and depravity. It was inconceivable that any alternative would have developed. What alternative could there have been, since we all know that man needs oats, lives oats, thinks oats? Are oats not his dearest possession and guarantee of his sovereignty of thought? Does man's stomach not reject any other intrusion? It has been suggested by would-be dissentients from oatism that man could, in fact, digest some other food than oats, the reasoning behind this speculation is remarkably ingenious. It is held that man can digest only oats because he has eaten them for so long that this has become a limitation. The dangerous nature of the corollary to this absurdity is that man could try to wean himself from oats, or else to eat, little by little, other things as well as oats. It is self-evident, however, that only the gullible and esoterist unbalanced would be interested in such an attempt. The risk, too, is that the resultant certain starvation would cause early death. Errors and Heresies, Volume 99, Oatland Defense Council Publication, SV Digestion Occasional troublemakers and those who dared, it is true, said to the Oatlanders, Why not eat fruit? but they were soon told, with rapier-sharp logic, a fruit is repugnant to any free-born Oatlander. Unthinking morons, too, were heard to say, Why not build with clay bricks? When they got any reply at all, which was more than they deserved, it soon put them in their place. Clay is for moles. Besides, Avena the first, a glorious founder, would have ordained and guided the use of clay if it had been of any use. When yet other adventurists said, Metal can be used to make tools, they were told, A tool of porridge is a real tool. A porridge metal would be a real metal. But autistic capacity was not limited to defending the porridge or tirelessly researching its values and uses. The philosophy could challenge all comers with an unanswerable dialectic. If any of these crazy ideas outside autism were capable of being useful in life, they could be explained in Oatlandese, the richest, most sublime medium of communication devised by man. On one occasion, an Otist theoretician said, You non-Otists are a mere rabble of mystics, esotericists, magicians, occultists, shamans, madmen, frustrated spinsters, gullible idiots, obsessionals, and hopeless cases. No, we are not, said the non-Otists. 
But the thing to realize is that they mostly were, by an overwhelming majority. And they were, ironically enough, because they had been driven that way by Otists. Real non-Otists, as distinct from sensationalists, were compelled to organize themselves in a tight and discreet manner for protection from the wilder Otists and the Oatland disaffected who clamored for admission, claiming the name of un-Otism and making more noise than anyone else. The Oatlanders only had to point to this rabble, who couldn't even grow oats, virtually to prove that all non-Otists were deranged. Meanwhile, of course, Otism was producing a rich and promising culture. Some idea of its extent and inspirational value may be gleaned from even small quotations from its hoary wisdom. When facts were short, or time limited, inspiration could come into its own, with such uplifting rallying cries as, 99 million Oatlanders can't be wrong. Nobody could accuse Oatlanders of being narrow-minded. Intense interest was aroused by genuinely new thoughts. One of the Otian philosophers demonstrated the continuing fecundity of the race by saying, I am a porridge man, therefore I exist. There was the occasional tyrant who said, Porridge, it is I. But such people died sooner or later, leaving the beauty and validity of the thing unchallenged. Oatland Forever is one of the most touching of the traditional heirs. Its opening words are, Graceful oat, holy oat, loving oat, giving oat, 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 oat. There were also revolutions in thought from time to time when the old sentimentalities were severely criticized. One such was when modernist writers explored the possibilities of new ways to express their inner being. The first few stanzas of a typical example of the new poetry show how the vitality of the human spirit had been maintained. Oat, Ota, Out, Tau The self-renewing sensation engendered by throwing off the shackles of hidebound traditionalism in this manner must surely be unique. Oaklandism, to be sure, employed arguments derived by sophistry and selection from its basic documents to support its beliefs. If anyone else adduced other documents, they were quite fitly characterized as regressive and unreliable. Fresh interpretations of the Oatland documents were accepted, or otherwise, according to whether the methods used were otiferous or not. Before dissentients were finally laughed into silence, some were reputed to have said, Don't abandon oats, but add other things to your life. You can do it. The reaction was that they were malcontents or lying, trying to unsettle people. Although society was continuously developing, some people always had an admiration for the old ways. Flowers used to be left on the statue of Avena I and of the Otis Martyr who said, Take my body and soul, you will never get my oats. The conservative element in this model open society where all forms of opinion were allowed free expression said, If there were any alternative to oats, people would not have used them for 50,000 years, would they? The progressives, who disagreed, said, There is a simple, though different, alternative. It is porridge. The liberal element hoped for a compromise based on baked oat cakes as a way of life. These are a few sayings preserved by this high culture as worthy of its greatest sons and daughters. If your oats are warm, use them as a plaster. If not, heat them. Oats rhymes with goats, but otherwise the two are poles apart. All that's sticky is not oats. An oat a day keeps cornmeal away. What, if anything, eventually happened to the Oatlanders? I'm afraid that I do not know. Some people say that they died out. 
it seems more likely that such a calumny arose in the minds of their envious detractors. Zaki and the Dove There was once a man named Zaki. Because of his capacities and his promise, a certain teacher, the Kaja, decided to help him. This Kaja assigned a subtle creature of special powers to attend upon Zaki and to help him whenever he could. As the years passed, Zaki found that his material and other affairs prospered. He did not imagine that such advantages as he was receiving were entirely due to himself, and he started to notice a coincidence of events. Whenever his affairs were about to go well, he observed, a small white dove was to be seen somewhere nearby. The fact was that the subtle attendant, in spite of his powers, needed to be within a certain distance of Zaki to carry on his work. In spite of his remarkable abilities, in his transition into the present dimension he had to take a form. A dove was the form which he had adopted as most suitable. But Zaki only connected doves with luck, and luck with doves. So he started to keep doves, and to put down food for any dove which he saw, and to have doves embroidered on his clothes. He became so interested in doves that everyone in the world thought him an authority on them. But his material and other affairs ceased to prosper, because his concentration had been diverted from intention to manifestation, and the subtle attendant in the form of a dove himself had to withdraw to avoid becoming a cause of Zaki's undermining of himself. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idrishar Foundation.